It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W2936106.5. So happy you have joined us today, tuning in. Place. Well, Holly, let's go to the IVOrganics.com hotline and bring our next guest. Let's go to Chicago, Illinois. Master gardener, horticultural expert, media expert, and all-around great guy. On very, He's on various media, media platforms. He explains how to grow sustainably and have gardening success through TV, radio, print presentations, and workshops. He uses gardening and greening to inspire people to get out and grow. Welcome to the program, William Moss. Hello. Wow, that's a nice intro. Well, we appreciate you taking time. I know you've got some activities going on at the community garden here uh, in just a little while, but we're glad you took some time to join Holly and myself and our listeners to share a little bit of your garden knowledge with all of us. Well, this is long overdue, and, and, and you know, when I hear you guys talking about beneficial insects, let me know I'm on the right track. <laughs> Well, let's talk about uh, people use all kinds of tools in the in the garden. We don't till, so we don't have a tiller. But that's not we're not discriminatory towards people who do. But shovels, uh, garden forks, all that. What is some basic tool maintenance as people need to uh, follow right now and even at the end of the season uh, when it comes to maintaining your your tools that you have? Well, the best thing to do when it comes to maintaining tools is to, is to do it do a little bit at a time. So, you know, don't, don't try to wait until the end of the year or your tool will be in too bad a shape. So the simplest trick you can do is to get you a bucket of sand. This is a, a five-gallon bucket. Fill it up with some, with some nice clay sand or, or even with some haven sand. You just need sand. And then every time you finish using your garden fork or your trowel or your shovel, you take that and just dump it down into that bucket. And the sand adds like a brillo pad and scrubs off a lot of things on it. Then you just take a little brush and brush it clean. The cleaner you keep your shovel, the sharper it will be. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a simplest trick I can say. That keeps it nice and clean. And then you can, at the end of the season, then you can get into the sharpening your tools and all of that. And, you know, just like in the kitchen, a, a, a properly maintained piece of equipment is a lot safer, too. Same thing with the, the garden tools. Definitely. It, it's, a lot, it's a lot safer, and it, and it does the trick a lot better. You do the work. I mean, I won't say how, how much faster, depends on how fast you work, but you'll definitely do your work faster with a sharper shovel or a sharper pair of pruners. And when it comes to pruning, now you do want to sharpen those. If you can sharpen it at least once a month during the season, you keep your cut, your, your cut clean, and then you'll have less chance to spread disease or less chance to cause damage by leaving a piece that's hanging on that gets infected or, gets, or invites some sort of pet. So sharp pruners all the time. Now, now, you don't have to sharpen your shovel every month, but you can definitely sharpen your pruners once a month. Now, some people will go ahead and coat them with a uh, commercial-grade uh, oil that uh, people might use on automotive equipment. Uh, that's not really the best thing when it comes to actually using that on plants and soil that you're growing your food in, is it? It is not the best thing. Now, people have used it, and that tip was out there for years, just use some old water oil and a bucket of sand and dip it in there and it makes it not only clean but makes it shiny too. I don't prefer that. I prefer using, uh, you know, for my vegetable garden, which typically is organic, you know, I, I, I try to keep everything in it nice and clean. I prefer to use either a horticultural oil or, you know, I'll use like an olive oil or, or like a corn oil or something like that um, to help sharpen and polish them up because I know that way if it's suitable for my, for my ingestion, then it shouldn't be bad anything for my plants. Now, many people are still planting tomatoes here and other other parts of the Midwest. What is the biggest mistake people make when planting tomatoes? Well, I mean, tomatoes are the most popular homegrown veggie on the planet. So the, the uh, list of mistakes is uh, is um, encyclopedic. But, <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll, just, I'll just say a couple of them. Number one is they plant them too shallow, I would say, uh, because, because tomatoes are one of the few plants Key vegetable plants that we grow that are capable of making adventitious roots along the stem. Take advantage of that. Plant it deeper. The more roots you have, the more production that you will have. So don't plant the plant shallow. Put it deep. I know everyone always tells you, keep, you know, plant the plant at the same soil line it had when it was in the pot. That's true for 90-something percent of plants. That is not true for tomatoes. You can plant it deep and give it a much better chance to establish itself. So that's probably the number one mistake they make. Number two is they water unevenly. Uh, you know, they'll come out, they'll water very heavily on a Sunday, and then maybe they'll sprinkle through the week or whatever, or, or just, or just kind of that one heavy water when they get them through. Tomatoes like 
like even watering. So, you know, they don't want to be wet all the time. They don't want to go through a bone drop phase. You can keep them nice and even. Then the root that has a taste, the, uh, the well, root is able to get the calcium out the soil that they need, and you won't have as much blossom in box. Right. Uh, we talked about and you we talked about the beneficial insects in the first segment of the program, and you've got a project going on at uh, the community garden here in a couple of a little bit. Explain what you're doing and and why you're doing it, just to solidify our conversation we had earlier on the program. Well, uh, both community gardens here in the Chicagoland area are um, well. They try to be pesticide free, or at least chemical free, is what they try to be because you don't know what the next person is using, and we try not to use many. So um, so pests can get a chance to get a hold. Uh, in most garden situations, you need to have a balance between between good bugs and bad bugs, and in a lot of artificial spaces, especially in an urban area, you know, we're sometimes sorely lacking the good bugs. The bad bugs come in, uh, you know, with the plant when you buy it, or they fly over from, from some field or something, and then they get in there and they can really wreak havoc. So, Aphids are one of those things that when they come in and find a garden, especially, like I said, when it's in the city and not really surrounded by a lot of natural area, they can get out of hand really fast. So by adding things like ladybugs and lace wings, we kind of help restore the balance. Now if, now, now, if you're way out somewhere where you've got woodlands around, you may have those creatures naturally come into your garden, but we don't. So, that, so we have to bring in ladybugs and we also bring in lace wings. Dragonflies also can do the trick. We're, we're near Lake Michigan. Dragonflies can kill. But the problem with dragonflies is they are indiscriminate killers, and they'll kill anything that moves in the garden. I mean, <laughs> lace wings and ladybugs would at least stay um, and eat the aphids. They'll stay around for a while and eat the aphids. So what we do every year is we come out and we bring the, you know, we tell the kids to come on out, and we get a bunch of ladybugs donated to us by Orcon, and they come out with their own container. Kids poke holes and do it's a milk jug or whatever. When we give them some ladybugs to take home to release in their garden, at the same time we release them in our community garden so they spread out and take care of the pet. That's great. Now, many people choose to grow in containers. There are many advantages to growing in containers. How do, first of all, how does one know what size to c- container to grow in for their planting? And is there one type of pot good for different material types, like maybe flowers should go in a certain pot versus vegetables, things like that? Oh, gracious, Holly, that is a question I teach courses on. I will try to run through it quickly. Um, <laughs> um, basically, for me, when I grow fruits and vegetables, terracotta, stone, uh, ceramic, all those pots are a no-no because I have broken them so many times. They look beautiful, but the problem is you have to dig around in them. You know, you bang the trowel against the side and you can break them. Or if you're growing root pots like potatoes or sweet potatoes, when you turn them over, they can easily break or snap. So, you know, I have spent, I have wasted too much money on pottery, uh, you know, busting them up to ever do that again. So now I grow all my vegetables inside of plastic and those, and those, uh, HDR or, or, or like, resinous pots that they have. They look fantastic. I mean, you can get these, these new, these new, um, Pots that look almost like ceramic, but they are ceramic. They're plastic or fiberglass or some sort of structure like that. They can take them and bang with your shovel. You can dig around in them. If you have to, you can dump them out to get, to get the contents out of them. It's easy to change the soil over in them. They weigh a whole lot less. So for me, I always say I would start with a pot that is plastic or some sort of plastic composite. And for vegetables, it has to be at least 15 inches in diameter for me. Uh, that gives me enough root run to grow everything from eggplants to tomatoes, um, you know, to, 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 to small squash and things like that. Now, once you start talking about some plants are just not great for containers, like okra, pumpkins, they're, they're too big to really do well in containers. And okra has a really deep tap root. I know okra's not really a popular crop here in the Midwest, but I'm telling you, if, if you take nothing else from what I'm saying today, all your listeners, if you take nothing else, Grow okra. It's an incredible plant with a beautiful flower, but it needs a ground space, not not a not a container. So you know, for most people, if you're growing regular, average vegetable crops, a 15 inch plastic composite container can look beautiful and do the trick. Well, it's great information. And the larger the container, the more soil mass, the slower it has the opportunity to dry out too. And that's something we always preach as well. That is that, that is definitely true. The larger the container. The, the more mass it has to hold soil and the more roots you get 
and the more roots you get, the more production you get up top. I've grown tomatoes in a 12-inch container, a 15-inch container, and a 22-inch container. By far, the 22-inch container gave more tomatoes. So, you know, the larger you go, the better. So bigger is better in most cases. <laughs> Now, you talk to people all the time, and we as well, and, and one of the questions or one of the comments we get is, oh, I can't grow anything. I've got a black thumb. Well, what are some good house plant maintenance tips that you can offer people who think that they can't grow anything? Well, it's also plant selection. You know, people, people think they can't grow anything, but there are plants that can grow inside your house that need almost nothing from you. Select those. Start there first. And usually when people say they can't grow something, that means that they either neglected it too much or, in most cases, gave it too much love. That's usually the problem. They wanted it too much. So start with plants like, like low-life plants that don't need much water, like a cast iron plant or a mother-in-law tongue or a potho, something like that. Choose one of those plants that, that don't need much from you and then make it, make it plain. Sunday is my day to water. That's it. You don't water any other day. You water it on Sunday, and you water it, and, and then you ask, or you go online, or you call into a show like yours and ask how much water. Like if someone were asking me how much water to give to a status of virus, which is a mother-in-law's plant, I would say give it a cup every Sunday. Just a cup of water every Sunday. And you, you, you set that in your mind that Sunday is your watering day, and then you don't do anything else all during the week to that plant. But usually what happens People forget when they water, so they're water extra or water more, and they rot the roots out on that plant. So start with plant selection. Get you a plant that doesn't need much, doesn't need much light, doesn't need much water, doesn't need much care. And then you make one day to maintain that plant, and then you'll find that it's easy to have a green thumb or easy to start cultivating that green thumb. But once you have this plant that does well, you may want to up the challenge to try something else. So uh, but start with those easy-to-grow plants cast iron, mother-in-law's tongue, things like that. Don't start with succulents, because people always say, well, cactus should be easy. You know, I'll grow a cactus. But cactus requires a lot of light, and the watering schedule can be a little tricky. Uh, you know, you don't want to give it much at all. So I would say start with something even simpler, a low-light plant, a low-light, easy-to-grow plant, and then go from there. Let me give one more tip if I can. Guys. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about the tomatoes again. Tomatoes are, are near and dear to my heart. So... One tip that I have found about tomatoes, and I found this out recently. I've grown tomatoes in containers for 20 years now, and in the ground for more than that. But one thing I found out about them is that there's a big, huge growth spurt of tomatoes right about now, from June through mid-July. That's when tomatoes get really rank, and that growth just goes nuts. Then they'll start to set a bunch of flowers, and you get fruit all throughout. If you like most people, need to reduce some of that rank growth, need to cut it back or pinching out suckers. So rather than pinching out my suckers, which, which was what I was taught to do when I, when I first learned how to do this, what I do now is I let everything just grow crazy for a couple of weeks and then go in and selectively prune out entire branches of the tomato to bring it back into shape. Now, what you do with those pruned out branches, so you'll have something to be two feet long, three feet long, four feet long, what you do with those is you replant them. And what I have found, what happens is, you put them in the ground deep, too, at least a foot down. What I found what happens is the uh, mother plant will flower and fruit, and a couple of weeks later, all those offspring that you cut off and put in the ground will start to flower and fruit. So what you will have is almost a continual chain of harvest. You'll be able to harvest everything and have a big flush from the mother plant then all those babies that you stuck in the ground somewhere and put out will do the same thing again. And that way I've really learned to extend my harvest and get a lot more. So rather than starting six sun gold tomato plants, I only start two sun gold tomato plants now, and I cut off four big branches to give me six by the end of the year. Makes it easier to start them, easier to get them growing. And when you put those big branches in the ground, you're guaranteed success. So that's my tomato tip of the day. Well, William, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join us and our listeners. For people who want to venture over and find out more information about you and the uh, all the stuff that you're doing, how can people find you? Um, I have a website, Get Out and Grow. So you type in getoutandgrow.com. I also have a .org domain, too. And please come check out my Facebook page. That's the one that's managed the most. Uh, Facebook at williammosstv.com. 
Well, William, thank you very much. Thank and, you, William. And a lot of great information that we can all take and use in our garden every day. Well, thank you guys so much for having me, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. If you're in the Milwaukee or surrounding areas, just tune your radio to 860 AM or FM 106.5. You can also find links on our Facebook pages, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and Home Canning. Our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, click on the radio tab at the top of the page, then click on the Listen Live button, and you'll have immediately access to our live program. Mobile devices work very well. Also, go to your app store and download for free the TuneIn app or the Simple Radio app. Then search WNOV 860, save it to your favorites, and you can have access to our radio show live wherever you're at in the world. Our radio program will also have podcast replay under the radio tab day, uh, several days following the live broadcast. You can find all of these links in the show notes below. Our show airs 9 to 10 a.m. Central Standard Time every Saturday, March through the end of October. And we want to thank our sponsors because without them, this would not be anywhere possible. You can find all of their links under the radio tab on our website at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.